Chapter fourteen of Loafing Along Death Valley Trails by William Carruthers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fourteen Shoshone Country Resting Springs. The country about Shoshone is identified with the earliest migration of Americans to California. It is a curious fact that prior to the coming of Jedediah Smith, who in eighteen twenty six was actually the first American to enter the state from the east the contented spanish believed that the sierras were insurmountable barriers to invasion by the hated american or any attacking enemy after smith the first white american to look upon the shoshone region so far as known was william wolfskill a kentucky trapper who left santa fe in eighteen thirty thirty one on a trading expedition with stores of cloth garments and gimcracks having had poor luck in disposing of his cargo when he reached the virgin river he decided to push westward across the mojave desert and entered california by way of cajon pass after resting at san gabriel he went north into the san joaquin valley there he disposed of his stock at fabulous prices taking in trade mules horses silks and other items which he took to taos and santa fe receiving for this merchandise equally huge profits wolfskill later settled in los angeles one of the earliest americans in the pueblo where he acquired large land holdings there he established the citrus industry planting a grove in what is now the heart of los angeles in eighteen thirty two joseph p childs organized a party at independence missouri and started for california it numbered fifty men women and children upon reaching fort laramie wyoming which was officially fort john but for some reason was never so called childs met joseph Redford walker and employed him as guide eighteen years before the bennett arcane party came to grief walker had discovered walker river and walker lake in nevada afterward named for him after reaching the sierras his jaded teams were unable to cross and had to be abandoned the party narrowly escaping death having heard of the southerly course over the old spanish trail he turned back and over it guided the child's party early in eighteen forty three john c fremont led a party of thirty-nine men from salt lake city northward to fort vancouver and in november of that year started on the return trip to the east this trip was interrupted when he found his party threatened by cold and starvation and he faced about crossed the sierra nevadas and went to sutter's fort after resting and outfitting he set out for the east by the southerly route over the old spanish trail which leads through the shoshone region at a spring somewhere north of the mojave river he made camp the water nauseated some of his men and he moved to another identification of these springs has been a matter of dispute and though historians have honestly tried to identify them the fact remains that none can say i was there in the vicinity were several springs any of which may have been the one referred to by fremont in his account of the journey among these were two water holes indicated on early maps as agua de tio mesa and another as agua de tomazo there are several springs of nauseating water in the area and some of the old-timers academically inclined insisted that fremont probably camped at saratoga springs which afforded a site of telescope peak or at salt spring nine miles east on the present baker shoshone highway at rocky point kit carson was fremont's guide fremont records that two mexicans rode into his camp on april twenty seventh eighteen forty four and asked him to recover some horses which they declared had been stolen from them by indians at the archelette spring thirteen miles east of shoshone one of the mexicans was andreas fuentes the other a boy of eleven years pablo hernandez while the indians were making the raid the boy and fuentes had managed to get away with thirty of the horses and these they had left for safety at a water-hole known to them as agua de tomaso they reported that they had left pablo's father and mother and a man named santiago giacome and his wife at archelette spring 
with fremont besides kit carson was another famous scout alexander godey a st louis frenchman a gay good-looking daredevil who later married maria antonia Coronel, daughter of a rich spanish don and became prominent in california in answer to the mexicans plea for help fremont turned to his men and asked if any of them wished to aid the victims of the paiute raid he told them he would furnish horses for such a purpose if any one cared to volunteer of the incident kit carson who learned to write after he was grown says in his dictated autobiography godey and myself volunteered with the expectation that some men of our party would join us they did not we too and the mexicans commenced the pursuit fuente's horse gave out and he returned to fremont's camp that night but godey carson and the boy went on they had good moonlight at first but upon entering a deep and narrow canyon utter blackness came even shutting out starlight and carson says they had to feel for the trail one may with reason surmise that godey and carson proceeded through the gorge that leads to the china ranch and now known as rainbow canyon when they could go no farther they slept an hour resumed the hunt and shortly after sunrise saw the indians feasting on the carcass of one of the stolen horses they had slain five others and these were being boiled carson's and godey's horses were too tired to go farther and were hitched out of sight among the rocks the hunters took the trail afoot and made their way into the herd of stolen horses says carson a young one got frightened and that frightened the rest the indians noticed the commotion sprang to their arms we now considered it time to charge on the indians they were about thirty in number we charged i fired killing one godey fired missed but reloaded and fired killing another there were only three shots fired and two were killed the remainder ran i ascended a hill to keep guard while godey scalped the dead indians he scalped the one he shot and was proceeding toward the one i shot he was not yet dead and was behind some rocks as godey approached he raised let fly an arrow it passed through godey's shirt collar he again fell and godey finished him subsequently it was discovered that godey hadn't missed but that both men had fired at the same indian as proven by two bullets found in one of the dead indians godey called these indians diggers the one with the two bullets was the one who sent the arrow through godey's collar and when godey was scalping him he sprang to his feet the blood streaming from his skinned head and uttered a hideous yowl godey promptly put him out of his pain they returned to camp rice fremont a war whoop was heard such as indians make when returning from a victorious enterprise and soon carson and godey appeared driving before them a band of horses recognized by fuentes to be part of those they had lost two bloody scalps dangling from the end of godey's gun fremont wrote of it later the place object and numbers considered this expedition of carson and godey may be considered among the boldest and most disinterested which the annals of western adventure so full of daring deeds can present it was indeed a gallant response to the plea of unfortunates whom they'd never seen before and would never see again when fremont and his party reached the camp of the mexicans they found the horribly butchered bodies of hernandez pablo's father and giacome the naked bodies of the wives were found somewhat removed and shackled to stakes fremont changed the name of the spring from archelette to agua de hernandez and as such it was known for several years he took the mexican boy pablo hernandez with him to missouri where he was placed with the family of fremont's father-in-law u s senator thomas h benton the young mexican didn't care for civilization and the american way of life and in the spring of eighteen forty seven begged to be returned to mexico senator benton secured transportation for him on the schooner flirt by order of the navy and he was landed at veracruz a record of which is preserved in the archives of the thirtieth congress eighteen forty eight three years later a rumor was circulated that the famed bandit joaquin murrieta was no other than pablo hernandez 
lieutenant afterwards colonel brewerton was at resting springs in eighteen forty eight with kit carson who then was carrying important messages for the government to new mexico he found the ground white with the bleached bones of other victims of the desert indians brewerton calls them pau u taus the mormons began early to look upon this region as a logical part of the state of desiree for the creation of which brigham young petitioned congress setting forth among reasons for the recognition of such a state that we are so far removed from all civilized society and organized government and also natural barriers of trackless deserts including mountains of snow and savages more bloody than either so that we can never be united with any other portion of the country as early as eighteen fifty one the far-seeing young decided to found a colony of saints in san bernardino california to extend mormon influence sam brannan a brilliant adherent of that faith had already come to california with the nucleus of a mormon colony in eighteen forty six two years before marshall discovered gold brannan became an outstanding figure among the argonauts none exceeded him in leadership or popularity in the building of san francisco and the state he grew rich and unfortunately began drinking finally abandoned mormonism and died poor the colonizers sent out by brigham young were in three divisions one under the leadership of amasa lyman who brought his five wives another was headed by charles c rich who was accompanied by three of his wives it is interesting to note that rich became the father of fifty-one children by five wives the third division was under the command of captain jefferson hunt guide for the entire party these leaders were all able men who were highly regarded by gentiles they also camped at agua de hernandez and it was the mormons who junked the previous name and gave one with significance they called it resting springs and this more fitting name has lasted on may twenty one eighteen fifty one the mormon elder parley p pratt heading a party of missionaries en route to the south sea islands writes in his diary we encamped at a place called resting springs this is a fine place for rest since leaving the vegas las vegas we have traveled seventy five miles through the most horrible desert twenty miles from the vegas we were assailed by a shower of arrows from the savage mountain robbers leaving resting springs the party arrived at salt spring gold mines toward evening in eighteen fifty phineas banning pioneer resident of los angeles and later owner of catalina island hauled freight from los angeles to the gold mine at salt spring opposite rocky point just south of the amargosa river on the baker road and in eighteen fifty four mormons discovered gold twenty-five miles south of resting springs long before dr french searched for the gun site in death valley the amargosa river is one of the world's most remarkable water courses originating at springdale north of Beatty, nevada it twists southward in zigzag pattern until it reaches a point about thirty-four miles south of shoshone there it turns west crosses highway one twenty seven enters death valley at its most southerly point and then turns north to disappear sixty miles from the place of its origin you may cross and recross it many times totally unaware of its existence but in the cloudburst season it can and does become a terrible agent of destruction in eighteen fifty three major george sharpening obtaining a contract to carry mail between the mormon colony of san bernardino california and salt lake to reach resting springs a station on the route required five days today it is a journey of four hours resting springs was also a relay station for white outlaws and indian raiders from utah wyoming and the dakotas even before fremont carson or the mormons old bill williams for whom bill williams river bill williams mountain and the town of williams arizona are named was at resting springs williams was a baptist preacher turned mountain man he had guided fremont through the terrors of the san juan country and was accused of cannibalism when hunger threatened one detachment of williams kit carson said in starving times don't walk ahead of bill williams 
Williams brought a band of Chaganosa's Indians to Resting Springs and made it an outpost for a horse-stealing raid. With him were Pegleg Smith and Jim Beckwith, the mulatto, who, after having been a blacksmith with Ashley's fur traders in 1821, became a famous guide, Indian chief, trader, and scout, also called Beckworth and Beckworth. Leaving Resting Springs, they proceeded through Cajon Pass for their loot, and on May 14, 1840, Juan Perez, administrator at San Gabriel Mission, excited Southern California when he announced that every ranch between San Gabriel and San Bernardino had been stripped of horses. Two days later, posses from every settlement in the valley started in pursuit. The raiders made it a running battle, defeated several detachments, adding the latter's stock and grub to their plunder. Five days later, reinforcements were sent from Los Angeles, Chino, and other settlements, all under the command of Jose Antonio Carrillo, ancestor of the movie celebrity Leo Carrillo. He had 225 horses, 75 men, 49 guns with braces of pistols, 19 spears, 22 swords and sabers, and 400 cartridges. The posse threw fear into the raiders but did not catch them, though the latter lost half of the stolen horses. At Resting Springs, Carrillo found some abandoned clothing, saddles, and cooking utensils. 1,500 horses that had died from thirst or lack of food were counted during the chase. Later, when Pegleg Smith was chided about the high price he demanded of an immigrant for a horse, he remarked, Well, the horses cost me plenty. I lost half of them getting out of the country and three of my best squaws. The earliest American settler at Resting Springs, remembered by old-timers, was Philander Lee, a rough and somewhat eccentric squaw man. He was big, straight as a ramrod, afraid of nothing, and of an undetermined past. He was there in the early 80s. He cleared 200 acres, raised alfalfa, stock, and some fruit. He had a way of adding the last part of his first name to his offspring. Leander and Meander are examples. Some of his descendants still live in the country. It was near Resting Springs Ranch, while Fee Lee owned it, that Jacob Brayfogle, of Lost Mine fame, was scalped by Hungry Bill's tribesmen. The story is told in another chapter. Fee Lee's brother, Cub Lee, who added spicy pages to the annals of Death Valley Country, built the first home erected at Shoshone, an adobe which still stands. It was long the home of the squaw and cowboy. Another brother of Fee Lee was known as Shoemaker because he roamed the desert as a cobbler. All were squaw men. Cub Lee established a reputation for keeping his word, and it was said no one ever disputed it and lived. Indians over in Nevada were giving a heap big party. His squaw wanted to go. Cub didn't. You stay home, he ordered. If you go, I'll kill you. He rode away and upon returning discovered she was absent. He leaped on his cayuse, went to the party and found her. Whipping out his gun, he killed both wife and son, blew the smoke out of his pistol, and leisurely rode away. But the Nevada officials thought Cub Lee was too meticulous about keeping his word, and Cub had a brief cooling-off period in the pen. Pegleg Smith made Resting Springs his headquarters for the greatest haul in the history of California horse sealing, and reached Cajon Pass before the theft was discovered. These horses were driven into Utah and there sold to immigrants, traders, and ranchers. Smith may be said to be the inventor of the lost mine as a means of getting quick money. The credulous are still looking for mines that existed only in Pegleg's fine imagination. Thomas L. Smith was born at Crab Orchard, Kentucky, October 10, 1801. With little schooling, he ran away from home to become a trapper and hunter, and following the western streams, eventually settled in Wyoming. He married several squaws, choosing these from different tribes, thus assuring friendly alliance with all. He had been a member of Le Grand's first trapping expedition to Santa Fe, and was an associate of such outstanding men as St. Brain, Sublet, Platt, Jim Bridger, Kit Carson, the merchant Antoine Rubido, properly Rubidoux, of St. Louis. 
he spoke several indian languages and earned the gratitude of the indians in his area by leading them to victory in a battle with the utes able and likable he also had iron nerves and courage his morals he justified on the ground that his were the morals of the day j g bruff historian whose gold rush journal and drawings is good material for research met smith on bear river august sixth eighteen forty nine and wrote in his diary peg leg smith came into camp he trades whiskey actually he traded anything he could lay his hands on while trapping for beaver with st bran on the platte smith was shot by an indian the bullet shattering the bones in his leg just above the ankle he was talking with St. Bran at the moment, and after a look at the injury, begged those about to amputate his leg. Having no experience, his companions refused. He then asked the camp cook to bring him a butcher knife, and amputated it himself, with minor assistance by the noted Milton Sublette. Smith was then carried on a stretcher to his winter quarters on the Green River. While the wound was healing, he discovered some bones protruding sublet pulled them out with a pair of bullet molds indian remedies procured by his squaws healed the stump and in the following spring of eighteen twenty eight he made a rough wooden leg thereafter he was called peg leg by the whites and wehu taco by all indians a wooden socket was fitted into the stirrup of his saddle and with this he could ride as skilfully as before in the lean last years of his life, he would be seen hopping along under an old beaver hat in San Francisco to and from Briggs and Kibbe's corner to Martin Horton's. Something in his appearance stamped him as a remarkable man. Major Horace Bell, noted Western Ranger, lawyer, author, and editor of early Los Angeles, relates that he saw Peg Leg near a mother load town, lying drunk on the roadside, straddled by his half breed son, who was pounding him in an effort to arouse him from his stupor. Smith had little success as a prospector, but saw in man's lust for gold ways to get it easier than the pick and shovel method in the pueblo days of los angeles smith was a frequent visitor at the bella union the leading hotel always surrounded by a spellbound group he lived largely when his money ran out he always had a piece of high-grade gold quartz to lure investment in his phantom mine and so we have the lost peg leg located anywhere from shoshone to tucson nevertheless no adequate story of the movement of civilization westward can ignore south pass and pegleg smith about twenty-five miles east of shoshone and set back from the road under willows and cottonwoods an old house identifies a landmark of parump valley the man's ranch once owned by the yunt family the original yunt was among the first settlers contemporary with philander and cub lee and aaron winters yunt was a squaw man and his children sam lee and john followed the father in taking squaws for their wives sam yunt was operating a small store at good springs and making a precarious living when a sleek and talented promoter secured a mining claim nearby and induced sam to enlarge his stock in order to care for the increased business promised by supplying provisions for the mine's employees sam with visions of quick profitable turnovers stocked the empty shelves for a few months the bills were paid promptly then lagged sam yielded to plausible excuses and carried the account finally his own credit was jeopardized and wholesalers began to threaten suits then he heard the sheriff had an attachment ready to serve in his desperation sam went to the debtor i'm ruined he pleaded you fellows will have to raise some money or we'll all quit eating the fellow said all i can give you is stock in the yellow pine it's that or nothing sam yunt had done with next to nothing all his life took the stock and waited for the sheriff then the miracle pay dirt and sam yunt was rich and now he did the natural thing he decided he would live at a pace that matched his means George Rose, an old friend, had a mine in the Abavitz, and he needed money. He went to Sam. Now that you're rich, he told Sam, you'll be taking life easy. I've got some swamp land on the coast near Long Beach. Best duck shooting I know of, and I'll sell it cheap. Sam didn't want it, but he bought it just to accommodate his friend. 
in a little while the swamp land was an oil field and oil added another fortune to yellow pine's gold sam put his squaw nancy away moved to the city and married a white woman nancy was provided for and for years she could be seen driving all over the desert in her buggy a later owner of the manse was one of whom the writer has a revealing memory a battered ford stopped at shoshone and an unshaven individual stepped out went into the store and came out with a loaf of bread and a chunk of bologna dirty underwear showed through a flapping rent in his patched overalls as he tore off a piece of bread and a chunk of the bologna and had his meal the uneaten portions he tossed into the toolbox wiped his hands on his thighs and his mouth on his hand jean kazarang brown chuckled won't pay six bits for lunch in the dining room worth two million dollars when the dinner gong sounded kazarang went to his toolbox retrieved the rest of the bologna twisted a hunk from the bread loaf tossed the rest back into the toolbox this time he saved a dollar he curled himself up in the ford that night and saved two dollars besides the man's ranch he had a ten thousand acre ranch in mexico stocked with sheep cattle and horses and had several mines jean's end was not a happy one one payday at his ranch the good-looking and likable young mexican who worked for him came for his money jean counted out the money from a poke and poured it into the palm of the mexican the mexican counted it and with a smile looked at jean pardon me senor it's two bits short be gone ordered jean but senor i have worked hard my wife is hungry and i am hungry my children are hungry be gone again shouted jean and whipped out his gun but the mexican was young lean and lithe and he seized jean's wrist and when he turned the wrist loose jean kazarang was dead and then the mexican made one mistake instead of going to the sheriff he became panic-stricken and taking the body to a nearby ravine he heaved it into the brush where it was found later feet up but jean kazarang had saved two bits a big luxuriously appointed hearse came for jean and people said it was the first decent ride he'd ever had in his life sentiment was with the mexican but he drew a short term for bungling because in one will jean left his property to his wife and in another to his housekeeper the estate was tied up in court where it remained for eleven years fat pickings for lawyers finally the widow was awarded one half the estate under community property law but the widow was dead the housekeeper got the other half and so ends the story of jean kazarang and two bits rarely did desert ranches show other profits than those which one finds in doing the thing one likes to do as in the case of a recent owner of the manse the wealthy mrs lois kellogg the soft-voiced eastern lady who fell in love with the desert drilled an artesian well the flow of which is among the world's largest small cultured she yet found thrills in driving a twenty-ton truck and trailer from the manse to los angeles or to the famed oasis ranch two hundred miles away in fish lake valley another desert landmark which she bought to further gratify her passion for the big wide open and there you have a slice of life as it is on the desert one miserably dying in his lust for money one fleeing its solitude another seeking its solace end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of loafing along death valley trails by william carruthers this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the story of charles brown the story of charles brown and the shoshone store begins at greenwater in the transient horde that poured into that town he was the only one who hadn't come for quick easy money on his own since he was eleven years old when he'd gone to work in a georgia mine he wanted only a job and got it in the excited loose-talking mob he was conspicuous because he was silent calm unhurried there were no law enforcement officers in greenwater the jail was a hundred and thirty miles away and every day was field day for the toughs better citizens decided finally to do something about it they petitioned george naylor inyo county sheriff at independence to appoint or send a deputy to keep some semblance of order naylor sent a badge over and with it a note 
pin it on some husky youngster unmarried and unafraid and tell him to shoot first again the citizens committee met well, i know a fellow who answers that description one of them said steady sort built like a panther came from georgia kind of slow motion until he's ready for the spring name's brown the badge was pinned on brown greenwater was a port of call for death valley slim a character of western deserts who normally was a happy-go-lucky likable fellow but periodically slim would fill himself with desert liquor his belt with six guns and terrorize the town shortly after brown assumed the duties of his office slim sent word to the deputy sheriff at death valley junction that he was on his way to that place for a little frolic tell him he coached his messenger sheriffs rile me and he'd better take a vacation after notifying the merchants and residents who promptly barricaded themselves indoors the officer found shelter for himself in Beatty, nevada so slim saw only empty streets and barred shutters upon arrival and since there was nothing to shoot at he headed through dead man's canyon for greenwater there he found the main street crowded to his liking and the saloons jammed he made for the nearest ordered a drink and whipping out his gun began to pop the bottles on the shelves at the first blast patrons made a break for the exits at the second the doors and windows were smashed and when slim holstered his gun the place was a wreck messengers were sent for brown who was at his cabin a mile away brown stuck a pistol into his pocket and went down he found slim in wandel's saloon the town's smartest there slim had refused to let the patrons leave and with the bartenders cowed the patrons cornered slim was amusing himself by shooting alternately at chandeliers the feet of customers and the plump breasts of the nude lady featured in the painting behind the bar following brown at a safe distance was half the population keyed for the massacre brown walked in hello slim he said quietly fellas tell me you're hogging all the fun better let me have that gun hadn't you like hell slim sneered i'll let you have it right through the guts as he raised his gun for the kill the panther sprang and the battle was on they fought all over the barroom standing up lying down rolling over first one then the other on top tables toppled chairs crashed for half an hour they battled savagely finally rolling against the bar both mauled and bloody there with his strong vice-like legs wrapped around slim's and an arm of steel gripping neck and shoulder brown slipped irons over the bad man's wrists get up brown ordered as he stood aside breathing hard slim rose leaned against the bar there was fight in him still and seeing a bottle in front of him he seized it with manacled hands and started to lift it slim brown said calmly if you lift that bottle you'll never lift another the bad boy instinctively knew the look that page's death and slim's fingers fell from the bottle greenwater had no jail and brown took him to his own cabin leaving the manacles on the prisoner he took his shoes locked them in a closet no man drunk or sober he reflected would tackle barefoot the graveled street littered with thousands of broken liquor bottles and then he went to bed waking later he discovered that slim had vanished and with him brown's number twelve shoes he tried slim's shoe but couldn't get his foot into it there was nothing to do but follow barefoot he left a blood-stained trail but at two a m he found slim in a blacksmith shop having the handcuffs removed brown retrieved his shoes and on the return trip slim went barefoot after hog-tying his prisoner brown chained him to the bed and went to sleep thereafter the bad boys scratched green water off their calling list slim afterwards attained fame with villa in mexico became a good citizen and later went east established a sanatorium catering to the wealthy and acquired a fortune among the first arrivals at greenwater was a lanky adventurer known to the indians as long man and to whites for his ability to make money in any venture and an even more marvelous inability to keep it he was ralph jacobus fairbanks broke at the time he was seeking the quickest way to a comeback foreseeing that the biggest names in copper met a rush he had taken a look at the little stagnant spring with a green scum that was to give the town its name 
not enough water in it to do the family washing he decided and with uncanny talent for seeing opportunity where others would starve to death he was soon peddling water at a dollar a bucket he had hauled it forty miles uphill from furnace creek wash a hopeful but late arrival who expected to find the town crowded with killers was an undertaker who came with a huge stock of coffins the prospect of a quick turnover seemed to guarantee success but in two years greenwater had exactly one funeral and he sold but one coffin disgusted he stacked the caskets in the center of his shop left and was never heard of again fairbanks came into town one day with his sweat-stained sixteen-mule team noticed the abandoned coffins picked out the largest and best and gave greenwater his first watering trough which was used as long as the town lasted fairbanks soon made enough money to acquire a hotel store and a bar which became a popular rendezvous fairbanks was born of well-to-do parents in a covered wagon en route to utah in 1857 of the thousands who flocked into greenwater only he and charles brown were to remain in death valley country and wrest fortunes from america's most desolate region to greenwater he brought his wife celestia abigail who shared his spirit of adventure but fortunately for him she possessed a caution which he lacked among their children was a beautiful and vivacious daughter stella fairbanks who was of the quick go-getting type didn't care for brown born in the north he was critical of the slow-moving silent young georgian and unacquainted with the deep south drawl he referred to him as that damned foreigner the reputation of the fairbanks camaraderie spread and mrs fairbanks who understood the longing of a youngster for a home-cooked meal invited brown to dinner there were other young fortune seekers in greenwater who were also occasional guests at the fairbanks dinners among them a yankee from maine harry oakes of whom the world was to hear later alan gilman known as the rattlesnake kid because of his stalking rattlesnakes to indulge his hobby of making hat bands and trinkets later to become associated with bernard mcfadden wealthy young mining engineers bank clerks with futures brown apparently had none he'll get out of the country like he came in afoot and broke rivals told stella so when romance came there was still a long trail ahead then came greenwater's first warning of trouble a few miners were laid off a few padlocks appeared on a few cabins a few merchants complained soon it was noticed that the tinny pianos from which slim-fingered professors swept the two-step and the waltz were gathering dust while the girls lolled in empty honkies but when diamond tooth lil padlocked her door and joined the rush to a new copper strike at cracker jack in the avavats mountains the wiser knew that greenwater was through with no guests fairbanks told off on his fingers departed patrons mine owners doctors lawyers just charlie left wonder what's keeping him celestial abigail knew she knew that the big georgian was desperately in love with stella and didn't care how many of her suitors left with mines closing and few official duties brown loaded a burrow with supplies and with joe yaron went on a prospecting trip their course led across death valley they were caught in a heat that was a record even for the big sink and ran out of water fortunately they were within a few miles of surveyor's well a stagnant hole north of stovepipe the burrows were also suffering and brown and yaron staggered to water barely in time to escape death the well there is dug on a slant and looking down they saw a prospector kneeling at the water filling a canteen and blocking passage reckon you fellows are thirsty he greeted i'll hand you up a drink have to strain it though full of wiggle tails he pulled his shirt tail out of his pants stretched it over a stew pan strained the water through it and handed the pan up to brown now nah, it's fit to drink he said proudly it was no time to be finicky charlie said we drank brown and yaron combed hill and canyon but failed to find anything of value yaron knew of another place you can have it brown said i left a good claim yaron eyed him a long moment and then grinned stella huh the sage in greenwater streets was rank now and again ralph fairbanks looked out over the dying town ma we're getting out he said he emptied his pockets on the table counted the cash 
ten dollars and thirty cents can't go far on that he was interrupted by a knock at the door there stood a stranger who wanted dinner and lodging for the night during the evening the guest disclosed that he was en route to his mining claim near a place called shoshone thirty-eight miles south it was near a spring with plenty of water warm but usable he wanted to put fifty miners to work but first he had to find someone willing to go there and board them maybe we'd go fairbanks said what'll you pay for board a dollar and a half a day figures around two thousand two hundred and fifty a month ralph looked at ma and she nodded it's a deal he said the next morning the guest left fairbanks turned to his wife i can haul these abandoned shacks down there in no time charlie's not working i can get him to help ralph fairbanks had stayed with greenwater to the bitter end and now he hauled it away the road to the new site was over rough desert gutted with dry washes brown slept in the brush put the shacks up while fairbanks went for others both worked night and day to get the place ready finally they had lodging for fifty men a dining room and quarters for the family with two thousand two hundred and fifty dollars a month they could afford a chef and ma could take it easy stella could go outside to a girls school then like a bolt of lightning came the bad news the greenwater guest they learned was just an engaging liar with no mine no men he was never heard of again without a dollar they were marooned in one of the world's most desolate areas stumped fairbanks looked at brown i've been rich i've been poor but this is below the belt what'll we do i can get a job with the borax company brown said but you we have that canned goods we brought to feed that liar's hired men i'll figure some way to live in this godforsaken hole from the dining room prepared for the two thousand two hundred and fifty dollars monthly income he lugged a table set it outside the door facing the road then he went to the pantry filled a laundry basket with the cans of pork and beans tomatoes corned beef and milk brought from greenwater he arranged them on the table wrenched a piece of shook from a packing crate and on it painted in crude letters the word store he propped it on the table and went inside ma he announced we're in business you could have hauled the entire stock and the table away in a wheelbarrow and every person in the county for a hundred miles in either direction laid end to end would not have reached as far as a bush league batter could knock a baseball the wheelbarrow load of canned goods went to the indians living in the brush and the prospectors camped at the spring another replaced it and the store moved then into the dining room prepared for the non-existent boarders powder a must on the list of a desert store was added the desert man they knew needed only a few items but they must be good overalls honestly stitched bacon well cured shoes sturdily built for hard usage if we sell a shoddy shirt an inferior pick or shovel to one of our customers they told the wholesaler we will never again sell anything to him nor to any of his friends soon the prospectors were telling other prospectors they met on the trails square shooters those fellows speak our language the squaws and the bucks told other squaws and bucks soon new trails cut across the desert to shoshone and soon the store outgrew the dining room in the fairbanks residence from sabrisky now an abandoned borax town a few miles south of shoshone an old saloon and boarding house was cut into sections and hauled to shoshone it had been previously hauled from greenwater where it had served as a labor union hall and clubhouse it was deposited directly across the road from the original store so began in nineteen ten an empire of trade that is almost unbelievable charlie had at last coaxed the right answer from stella but there wasn't enough in the business at the start to support two families plus the score of children and grandchildren of fairbanks at greenwater he had known all the moguls of mining and he had only to ask for a job to get one retaining his interest in the shoshone store he became superintendent of the pacific borax company's important lila c mine and thus formed a connection which grew into valuable friendships with the executives the shoshone business grew and soon required his entire time and that of stella born in richfield utah stella brown grew up in death valley country and a reel of her life would show an exciting story of triumph over life in the raw 
in desolate deserts and in boom towns where bandits and bawdy women rubbed elbows with the virtuous millionaire with crook and caste was unknown if a girl went wrong if an indian was starving a widow in need there you would find her some day somebody will write the inspiring story of stella brown not all those who were told to see charlie were seeking directions or suffering from toothache when general electric desperately needed talc its agents were so advised when harold dix came out to promote president roosevelt's conservation ideas and officials of the war department sought critical material they too were given the old familiar advice and took it and one day i saw the president of the southern pacific railroad stand around for an hour while charlie waited for a parump indian to make up his mind about a pair of overalls Today, the store that started on a kitchen table requires a large refrigerating plant and lighting systems, three large warehouses, two tunnels, and a hill. About a dozen employees work in shifts from seven in the morning till ten at night to take care of the store, cabins, and cafe. Three big trucks haul oil, gas, powder, and provisions to mines in the region out of canyon dry wash and over dunes they come for every imaginable commodity and get it a millionaire city man who vacations there sat down on the slab bench beside brown aimlessly whittling listen charlie he said why don't you get out of this desolation and move to the city where you can enjoy yourself hell charlie muttered and went on with his whittling the new store stands upon the site where Ma Fairbank's kitchen table displayed the canned goods brought from Greenwater. Modern to the minute and air-cooled, it would be a credit to any city. Again I heard the old familiar see Charlie, and while he was telling someone how to get to a place no one had ever heard of, I glanced over the Chalfont Register, a bishop paper, and noticed a letter it had published from a lady in Wisconsin seeking information about her brother who had gone to Greenwater more than forty years ago. She had never heard of him since. When Charlie joined me, I called his attention to the letter. I saw it, he said. Nobody answered, and the editor sent the letter to me. I have just written her that the brother, who came to find out what happened, died suddenly at Tonopah, only a few hours by auto from Greenwater. The other brother was killed in a saloon. I knew him and the man who killed him. End of chapter 15「Sixteen of Loafing Along Death Valley Trails by William Carruthers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16. Long Man, Short Man Before Tonopah, the first, and Greenwater, the last of the boom camps, Indians roaming the desert from Utah westward were showing trails to two hikos who were to become symbols for the reckless courage needed to exist in the wasteland. They were known as Long Man and Short Man previous pages have given part of the story of long man coming into death valley country in the late nineties ralph jacobus fairbanks wanted to know its water holes trails and landmarks he hired panamint tom brother of hungry bill as a guide because tom's name was linked with bills and stories of missing men fairbanks carried a six-gun panamint tom was also armed when they reached the rim of death valley and started down fairbanks said tom this is indian country you know it i don't you go first taking no chance on a surprise night attack he directed the layout of the camp so that their beds were safely apart each slept with his gun around the campfire tom nonchalantly confessed that he'd had to kill five white men the mission accomplished they started back when they came out of the valley tom said long man this is white man's country you know it i don't you go first in after years referring to their trip tom said long man you heap frayed that time i was fairbanks confessed me too tom said when the goldfield strike was made fairbanks saw that a supply station on the main line of travel was a surer way to wealth than the gamble of digging he knew of a ranch with good water and luxuriant wild hay at ash meadows hay was worth two hundred dollars a ton the owner had abandoned the ranch however and moved into the hills fairbanks could get little information concerning his whereabouts up there somewhere he was told with a gesture indicating fifty miles of skyline 
but he wanted the hay and started out and by patient inquiry located his man just before daylight on the second day what will you give for it the man asked well fairbanks parried you know it'll cost me as much as the ranch is worth to get rid of that wild grass having only a vague idea of its real worth he had decided to offer four thousand dollars but since the man's eagerness to sell and started to offer a thousand dollars suddenly it occurred to him that someone else might have made an offer i'll go two thousand dollars and not a nickel more you've bought a ranch the owner said elated fairbanks wrote a contract by candlelight on the spot both signed and they started back to find a notary i determined the fellow should not get out of my sight until the deed was recorded if he wanted a drink of water so did i if he wished to speak to someone i wanted a word with the same man finally the deal was closed and fairbanks started home outside he met at metcalf chuckling what's so funny ed metcalf pointed to the departing seller he was just telling me about being worried to death all morning for fear a sucker he'd found would get out of his sight he's been trying to unload his ranch for five hundred dollars and some idiot gave him two thousand fairbanks also operated a freighting service to the boom towns in the gold belt as far north as goldfield and tonopah rates were fantastic and he made a fortune he opened Beatty's first cafe in a tent money was plentiful and after a trip with a sixteen mule team over rough roads to goldfield he was ready for a relaxing change to poker when the white chips were twenty-five dollars the reds fifty dollars and the blues five hundred dollars the game is not for pikers and he would bet ten thousand dollars as calmly as he would ten cents in such a game one night he found himself sitting beside a player who had removed his big overcoat with wide patch pockets and hung it on his chair fairbanks noticed the fellow had a habit of gathering in the discards when he wasn't betting and his deal would follow he also noticed intermittent movements of the fellow's deft fingers to the big patch pocket and soon saw that every ace in the deck reposed in the pocket later in the game fairbanks opened a jackpot every man stayed the crook raised discreetly and most of the players stayed fairbanks bet a thousand dollars have to raise you five thousand dollars the crook said fairbanks met the raise and it'll cost you five thousand dollars more he said evenly with the confidence that came from the cashed aces the sharper shoved out the five smiled exultantly as he spread four kings and a deuce and reached for the pot not so fast fairbanks said as he laid four aces and a ten on the table the crook gave him a quick look fairbanks eyes were steady neither said a word the crook couldn't he knew that fairbanks long fingers had found the big patch pocket when three men and a jackass no longer made a crowd in shoshone ralph fairbanks became restless with a population of twenty half of it his own progeny he felt that civilization was closing in on him charlie i've been in one place too long he had now become dad fairbanks to all who knew him the automobile was being increasingly used in desert travel and transcontinental trips were no longer a daring adventure or the result of a bet sixty miles south of shoshone there was a wretched road that pitched down the washboard slope of one range into a basin then up the gully crossed slopes of another part of the transcontinental highway it was a headache to the traveler radiators usually boiled downhill and up to this desolate spot went dad fairbanks the hot blasts from the dunes of the devil's playground and the dry bed of soda lake made summer a hell and the freezing winds from providence mountains turned it into a siberian winter here in nineteen twenty eight dad fairbanks built cabins and a store and installed a gas pump water was hauled in coming or going he said when they reach this place they've just got to stop cool the engine and fill up for the hill ahead the place is baker on highway ninety one here as at shoshone sales technique was tossed into the ash can stopping for dinner one day i met dad coming out of the dining room how's the fare i asked are you hungry hungry as a bear all right go in a hungry man can stand anything then in an undertone he added employment agent sent me the world's worst cook take eggs later as we talked in the sheltered driveway a rolls royce limousine drove up and a well-fed and smartly tailored tourist stepped out and spoke to dad do you know me he asked dad looked at him hesitantly oh, face is familiar you loaned me three hundred dollars twenty-five years ago well, i loaned a lot of fellows money but i never paid it back 
a hell of a lot of em didn't dad said the stranger reached into his pocket pulled a thousand dollars from a roll and handed it to dad i'm harry oakes he said where's ma so they went over to dad's house and with ma fairbanks who had shared all of dad's fortunes good and bad they sat down and oakes talked of the long trail that led from three hundred borrowed dollars to an annual income of five million harry oakes had gone to canada and learning that the legal title to a mining claim would expire at midnight on a certain date he and his partner w g wright sat up in a temperature of forty below to relocate the lake shore mine canada's richest gold property born in maine harry oakes became a subject of england and was at this time canada's richest citizen with an estimated fortune of two hundred million dollars it was a long way from the niagara palace back to greenwater and shoshone and as ma fairbanks and dad and harry sat in the plain little desert cottage i couldn't keep from wondering why a man with two hundred million dollars would wait twenty-five years to repay that three hundred dollars in his native town of sangerville in maine harry oakes was criticized when as a youngster with every opportunity to pursue a successful career according to the staid maine formula he became excited by gold quick easy money uh, just a dreamer he talked big acted big and was big but harry oakes started out in life to make a fortune by finding a gold mine and you can't laugh aside the determination and courage with which he stuck to his purpose until he succeeded dad fairbanks spent nearly fifty years in death valley country and it is a bit ironical that at last the baker climate drove him from the desert to santa paula and later of all places to hollywood i should never have believed it of you i kidded hell dad retorted i wanted solitude haven't you got enough sense to know that the loneliest place on god almighty's earth is a city he died in 1943, and at the funeral were the state's greatest men and its humblest, bankers, lawyers, doctors, beggarmen, muckers, and miners, and with them those he loved best, sun-baked fellows from the towns and the gulches along the borough trails. No man who has lived in Death Valley country did more to put the region on the must list of the American tourist, and none won more of the regard and affection of the people. End of chapter 16chapter 17 of loafing along death valley trails by william carruthers this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 17 shorty frank harris no history of death valley has been written in this century without mention of the short man frank shorty harris and none can be previous pages have given most of his story after his death at least two hurried writers who never saw him have stated that shorty discovered no mines knew little of the country from a page of notes made before i had ever met him i find this record stopped at independence to see george naylor early inyo county sheriff and now its treasurer we talked of early prospectors naylor said i have known all of the old-time borough men and have the records shorty harris has put more towns on the map and more taxable property on the assessor's books than any of them i first met shorty at shoshone entering the store one day charles brown told me there was a fellow outside i ought to know and in a moment i was looking into keen steady eyes blue as water in a canyon pool and in another shorty harris was telling me how to sneak up on ten million dollars thus began an acquaintance which was to lead me through many years from one end of death valley to the other with shorty mentor friend and guide of course i had heard of him who hadn't in the gold country of western deserts one could find a few who had never heard of cecil rhodes or john hayes hammond but none who had not heard of shorty harris wherever mining men gathered the mention of his name evoked the familiar oh, that reminds me and the air thickened with history laughter and lies he was five feet tall quick of motion hands and feet small skin soft and surprisingly fair muscles hard as bull quartz with a mask of ignorance he concealed a fine intelligence reserved for intimate friends in moments of repose 
it is regrettable that since shorty's death writers who never saw him have given pictures of him which by no stretch of the imagination can be recognized by those who had even a slight acquaintance with him authors of books properly examine the material of those who have written other books in the case of shorty this was eagerly done so eagerly in fact that each portrayal is the original picture altered according to the ability of the one who tailors the tale all are interesting but few have any relation to truth shorty harris was so widely publicized by writers in the early part of the century that when the radio was invented he was a natural for playlets and columnists it was natural also that the iconoclast appeared to set the world right he employed shorty to guide him through death valley i want to write a book he explained and i have only three weeks to gather material the trip ended sooner what happened i asked shorty when i read the book and was startled to see in it a statement that shorty became lost had never found a mine and never even looked for one did he say that shorty laughed and more of the same i said well let's let it go for what it's worth he belly ached from the minute we set out those who knew shorty best dad fairbanks charles brown bob montgomery george naylor h w eichbaum and the old-timers on the trails had entirely different impressions there was however around the bar-rooms of Beatty and other border villages a breed of late-comers professional old-timers always waiting and often succeeding in exchanging history for free drinks though they may have never known shorty in person they were not lacking in yarns about him and rarely failed to get an audience there were also among shorty's friends a few who had another attitude what has he ever done that i haven't the answer being that nothing had been written about them with variations the original pattern became the pattern for the succeeding writer in the interest of accuracy it is not amiss to say that shorty harris was not buried standing up the writer saw him buried it is not true that he ever protested the removal of the road from the site of the place where he wished to be buried because he never knew that he would be buried there nor did he have the remotest idea that a monument would be erected to him because the idea of the monument was born after his death as related elsewhere he did not leave harrisburg on july fourth nineteen o five to get drunk at ballarat instead he went to rhyolite to find wild bill corcoran his grub staker he did enjoy the yarns attributed to him and their publication in important periodicals but he was also painfully shy and ill at ease away from his home even at the annual death valley picnics held at wilmington near los angeles he could never be persuaded to face the crowds one cannot laugh aside the part he played nor the monument that honors one of god's humblest his strike at rhyolite brought two railroads across the desert gave profitable employment to thousands of men added extra shifts in steel mills and factories making heavy machinery and those of tool makers the building trades felt it banks security exchanges and scores of other industries over the nation all because shorty harris went up a canyon and it is not amiss to ask if these historians did their jobs as well at my home it was difficult to get shorty to accept invitations to dinners to which he was often invited by service clubs but in the ballarat cabin he was as sure of himself as the mcgregor with a foot upon his native heath and an eye on ben lomond his passion for prospecting was fanatical i asked him once if he would choose prospecting as a career if he had his life to live over i wouldn't change places with the president of the united states my only regret is that i didn't start sooner when i go out every time my foot touches the ground i think before the sun goes down i'll be worth ten million dollars but you don't get it i reminded him he stared at me with a sort of you're too dumb look who in the hell wants ten million dollars it's the game man the game nor is the picture of his profligacy altogether true despite shorty's disregard for money he had a canniness that made him cash something against the rainy day at lone pine charlie brown was packing shorty's suitcase before taking him to a doctor shorty what's this lump in the lining of your vest oh there was a hole in it poor job of mending i guess shorty answered guilelessly i'll see charlie said and ripping a few stitches removed six hundred dollars in currency 
shorty's last years furnish a story of a man too tough to die he had had three major operations when in nineteen thirty three i received the following telegram wall fell on me hurry bring doctor shorty harris it had been sent by fred gray from trona twenty seven miles from ballarat nearest telegraph station my wife and i hurried through rain snow sleet over washed out desert and mountain roads outside the cabin in the dusk shivering in a cold wind we found two or three of shorty's friends and charles and mrs brown who had also made a mad dash of a hundred and fifty miles over roads some of which hadn't been travelled in thirty years puttering around his cabin shorty had jerked at a wire anchored in the walls and brought tons of adobe down upon himself he was literally dug out his ribs crushed face black with abrasions with rapidly developing pneumonia he had lain for sixty hours without medical attention and with nothing to relieve pain we learned later from dr walter johnson who had preceded us that if a hospital had been within a block it would have been fatal to move him all agreed that death sat at shorty's bedside a cat has only nine lives fred gray said gravely and outside in the gathering gloom we planned his funeral because of the isolation of ballarat and lack of communication we arranged that when the end came fred gray would notify brown and bring the body down into death valley for burial there we would meet the hearse because bodies decompose quickly in that climate time was important when we planned these details my wife who had been at shorty's bedside joined us shorty's not going to die she said he's planning that trip up signal mountain you and he have been talking about i tiptoed into the room he was staring at the ceiling seeing faraway canyons the yellow fleck in a broken rock suddenly he spoke i'm losing a thousand dollars a day lying here why that ledge a week after returning to our home we received another telegram from trona asking that we come for him he had insisted upon being laid in the bed of a pickup truck and taken across the slate range to trona where we met him at our home he lay on his back for weeks fed with a spoon always talking of putting another town on the map always losing a million dollars a day he was miraculously but slowly recovering when an associated press dispatch bearing a lone pine date made front page headlines with an announcement of his death though the report was quickly corrected his presence at our house brought reporters photographers old friends and the merely curious at the time the pacific coast borax company's nbc program was featuring stories based on his experiences over a nationwide hookup among the callers also were moguls of mining and tycoons of industry who had stopped at the ballarat cabin to fall under the spell of his ever ready yarns among these guests one stands out it was a hot summer day when i saw on the lawn what appeared to be a big bear because the squat bulky figure was enclosed in fur answering the doorbell i looked into twinkling eyes and an ingratiating smile they told me in ballarat that shorty harris was here i invited him in i'll just shed this coat he said stripping off the bearskin garment sort of heavy for a man going on eighty he laid it aside it's double lined fur inside and out you see i sleep in it crossed three mountain ranges in that coat before i got here may as well take this other one off too he removed another heavy overcoat revealing a cord around his waist keep this one tied close less bulky under a shorter coat was a heavy woolen shirt and his overalls concealed two pairs of pants he went on i was with shorty at leadville my name's pete harman we ought to be rich both of us why i sold a hole for twenty five hundred dollars in eighteen seventy eight thought i was smart they's got over a hundred million dollars out of that hole i was at bridgeport when i heard shorty was sick so i says i'll just step down to ballarat and see him the step was two hundred and ninety eight miles when i got there bob warnick tells me he's in los angeles when i get there they tell me he's with you so i just stepped out here he had stepped four hundred and eighty one miles to see his friend i ushered him in and left them alone after an hour i noticed pete outside smoking i went out and urged him to return and smoke inside but he refused it's not manners he insisted 
later i happened to look out the window and saw him empty the contents of a small canvas sack into his hand there were a few dimes and nickels and two bills he unfolded the currency one was a twenty the other a one he put the coins in the sack and came inside a few moments later from an adjacent room i heard his soft lowered voice shorty i'm eatin regular now and got a little besides i reckon you're kind of shy you take this no no pete i'm getting along fine i fancy there was a scurry among the angels to make that credit for pete Harmon. late in the afternoon pete donned his coats i'd better be going i've got a lot of things on hand a claim in the argus when the money comes in well i always said i was going to build a scenic railroad right on the crest of panamint range best view of death valley it'll pay how far is it to san diego well a hundred and forty miles well since i'm this far along i'll just step down and see my old partner take care shorty and down the road he went with humility i watched his passage hoping that the good god would go with him and somehow i felt that of all those with fame and wealth or a high degree who had gone from that house none had left so much in my heart as pete during this period of convalescence shorty was often guest in homes of luxury and when at last i took him to ballarat i was curious to see what his reaction would be to the squalor of the crumbling cabin when we stepped from the car he noticed camel the blind burro drowsing in the shade of a roofless dobe old fella he said it's damn good to see you again i unloaded the car brought water from the well and sat down to rest shorty sat in a rickety rocker braced with bailing wire i regarded with amusement the old underwear which he'd stuffed into broken panes the bare splintered floor the cracked iron stove that served both for cooking and heating the wood box beside it the tin wash pan on a bench at the door then i noticed shorty was also appraising the things about the hole in the roof the box nailed to the wall that served as a cupboard a half-burned candle by his sagging bed for a long time he glanced affectionately from one familiar object to another and finally spoke will haven't i got a damn fine home for ages poets have sung orators have lauded but so far as i'm concerned shorty said it better the last orders from the surgeon had been complete rest for three months in the late afternoon we moved our chairs outside the sun still shone in the canyons, and after he had seen that all his peaks were in place, he turned to me. I'm losing five million dollars a day sitting here. Soon as you're rested, we'll start. You'll be in shape by day after tomorrow, won't you? I restrained a gasp as he pointed to the side of a gorge eight thousand feet up on Signal Mountain. No trip at all. No argument could convince him that the trip was foolhardy, and on the third day we started through Hall's Canyon opposite the Indian Ranch. The ascent from the canyon is so steep that in many places we had to crawl on hands and knees. The three and a half miles were made in seven hours, but on the return the inevitable happened. Shorty, exhausted, staggered from the trail and collapsed. When he rose, he wobbled, but managed to reach a bush and rolled under it i ran to his side it seemed the end uh, you you go ahead he said weakly i'm through i had given him all my water and exacting a promise that he would remain under the bush i started for help at the indian ranch to bring him out coming up i had paid no attention to the trail and was uncertain of my way which was further confused by crisscross trails of wild burros and mountain sheep coming to a canyon that forked i was not sure which to take and panicked with fear took a sudden uncalculated choice and started up a trail the desert gods must have guided my feet for it proved to be the right one and an hour later i came upon the green seepage of water i dug a hole let the scum run off then drank slowly and lay down to rest in my last conscious moment a huge rattler passed within a few inches of my face but rattlers were unimportant then, and I went to sleep. The swish of brush woke me, and I saw Shorty staggering down the trail. He fell beside the water and was instantly asleep. Time, I knew, was the measure of life, and I allowed him twenty minutes to rest, then awoke him and made him go in front. On a ledge he slumped again, his body hanging over the cliff with a thousand-foot fall to rocks below. 
i managed to catch him by the seat of his trousers as he began to slip and i dragged him back on the trail somehow i got him to the bottom there the canyon widens upon a level area covered with dense growth walking ahead i suddenly missed him he had crawled from the trail and it required an hour to find him and this i did by the noise of his rattly breathing i half carried half dragged him to the car and lifted him in he was asleep before i could close the door and remained unconscious for the entire eleven miles of corduroy road to ballarat there fred gray and bob warnock lifted him from the car and laid him on his bed none of us believed that shorty harris would ever leave that bed alive the next morning i tiptoed softly out of the room went over to the old saloon and had breakfast with tom the caretaker afterward we sat outside smoking and talking of hungry hattie's feuding and her sister's mining deals when we heard steady thumping sounds coming from shorty's place we looked bareheaded shorty harris was chopping wood shorty was born near providence rhode island july second eighteen fifty six he had only a hazy memory of his parents his father a shoemaker died impoverished when shorty was six years old i went to live with my aunt if she couldn't catch me doing something she figured i'd outsmarted her and beat me up on general principles at nine he ran away and obtained work at the textile mills of governor william sprague dipping calico the village priest taught him to read and write and apart from this his only school was the alley the curriculum of the alley is hunger tears and pain but somehow in that alley he found time to play and learned that with play came laughter thenceforth life to shorty harris was just one long play day in eighteen seventy six he started west and crawled out of a box car in dodd city kansas above were stacks of buffalo hides bellowing cattle chippies gamblers cowhands and a chance for youngsters who had come out of alleys among those i remember at dodd city were my friends wyatt earp and a thin fellow with a cough if he liked you he'd go to hell for you it was doc holliday the coldest killer in the west I had a job in a livery stable. Job was all right, but too much gunplay. Cowboy shooting up the town. Gambler shooting cowboys. Flushed with his paycheck, Shorty wandered into a saloon and met one of the percentage girls, a lovely creature, not altogether bad. They danced, and Shorty suggested a stroll in the moonlight, and soon Shorty was in love. Shorty, she asked, why be a sucker? Why don't you go to Leadville? You might find a good claim i'm broke he told her i've got money she said and reached into her purse i'm no mac he snapped finally she thrust the bills into his pocket at leadville he went up a gulch luck was kind he found a good claim and going into leadville sold it for fifteen thousand dollars later it produced millions within a week he was penniless why all i've got to do is to go up another gulch he told sympathetic friends on this trip his feet were frozen and he was carried out on the back of his partner taken to the hospital the surgeon told him that only the amputation of both feet would save his life telling a group of friends about it in the ballarat cabin later shorty of course had to add a few details of his own dan driscoll came to see me and i told him what the sawbones said why hell dan says won't be nothing left of you you've got to get out of here when that nurse goes i'll take you to a doc who'll save them feet and the first thing i knew i was in the other hospital the doc whetted his meat cleaver picked up a saw and was about to go to work when he found there was nothing to dope me with i'll fix it doc says and wham he slapped me stiff i don't know what he did but when i came to i was as good as new after selling a second claim to haw tauber shorty was again in the money and remembered the girl in dodge city returning he looked her up took her to dinner they danced and dined and shorty toasted her in bubble water i reckon everybody in dodge city thought a caliph had come to town no little girl suffered for new toggery no bum lacked a tip in a week i was broke again going down to the freight yard to steal a ride on the rods i met the girl and the next i knew i was begging her to marry me shorty you don't know anything about my past and still you want to marry me you don't know anything about my past either i said but it was no go Years afterward, when Shorty and I were camped in Hall Canyon, I asked him if he would actually have married a girl like her. Who am I to count slips, he bristled. I did ask her, and he swabbed a tear that had dried fifty years ago. 
in eighteen ninety eight after working for a grub stake he started on the trip that led at last to death valley by way of the san juan country one of the world's roughest regions i walked through arizona to northern mexico every mile of it desert a labor strike in colonel green's mines threw me out of a job and i started back ran out of water and lived five days on the juice of a bulbous plant la flora morada each bulb has a few drops on the mojave i ran out of water again finally saw a mangy old camel drinking at a pool i had enough sense left to know there were no camels around and went on till i flopped a fellow picked me up i told him i'd been so goofy i'd seen a camel in water but i knew it was just a mirage you damned fool he said it was a camel and you saw water high jolly turned that camel loose shorty reached tintic utah and from there walked over a waterless desert to the johnny mine where he was given shelter food and clothing bishop cannon of the mormon church sent him into the panamint to monument a gold claim i was the only fool they could find across death valley in midsummer i found the claim but it proved to be patented land shorty was recuperating from his last operation at my home when he came into the house one morning with fire in his eyes and a paper in his hand read that and let's get going it has been erroneously stated that shorty couldn't read though he had little schooling and a cataract impaired his sight he could read to the end the paper announced a strike in tuba canyon near ballarat why i know a place nobody ever saw but me and a few eagles his losses increased from a thousand to a million dollars a day because he wasn't on the job and in may we started for ballarat by the longer route through death valley when we reached jim dayton's grave he asked me to stop and getting out of the car he walked into the brush returning with a few yellow and blue wild flowers laid them on dayton's grave god bless you old fella you'll have to move over soon and make room for me then turning to me he said when i die bury me beside old jim raising his hand and moving his finger as if he were writing the words he added above me write here lies shorty harris a single blanket jackass prospector it was his way of saying he had played his game not by riding over the desert with a deluxe camping outfit but the hard way with beans and a single blanket he was also saying i think good-bye to the death valley that he loved its golden dunes its creeping canyons and pots of gold about one o'clock in the morning sunday november eleventh nineteen thirty four the phone awakened me at the other end of the line was charles brown shorty harris lay dead at big pine he just went to sleep and didn't wake up charlie said shorty had died saturday morning november ten and charlie had arranged for the remains to be brought down into death valley and buried beside james dayton sunday afternoon out of los angeles out of towns and settlements canyons and hills came the largest crowd that had ever assembled in death valley to wait at furnace creek ranch for the hearse that would come nearly two hundred miles over the mountains from big pine it was delayed at every village and by burrow men along the road who wanted a last look upon the face of shorty at one o'clock the caravan arrived and then began the procession down the valley the sun was setting and the shadows of the panamint lay halfway across the valley when the grave was reached brown had sent ernest hun from shoshone the night previous a distance of about sixty miles to dig the grave on the desert a man dies and gets his measure of earth often with not so much as a tarpaulin with this in mind ernie had made the hole to fit the man but with the coffin it was a foot too short while waiting for the grave to be lengthened the casket was opened and in the fading twilight shorty's friends passed in file about the casket while the indians silhouetted against the brush paid silent tribute to him whom their fathers and now their children knew as short man so began the first funeral ever held in the bottom of death valley drama packed into a few moments of a dying day no discordant ballyhoo no persiflage the lord is my shepherd i shall not want a bugler stepped beside the grave and silvered notes of taps went over the valley the casket was lowered into the grave as the stars came out and he was covered with the earth he loved thoughtful women placed wreaths of atoll and desert holly and with his face toward his desert stars shorty harris holed in forever 
going back to shoshone with the browns i told charlie of the time i had stopped at jim dayton's grave with shorty i made up my mind then that i would do something about his last wish there's no liar like a tombstone but shorty deserves a marker well i'll join you charlie said charlie consulted park officials and they approved chosen to write the epitaph i knew from the moment the task was assigned to me what it would be in order to get the reaction of others to the use of the word jackass on the monument i decided to try it out on the browns this epitaph i said might be unconventional but unless i am mistaken it will be quoted around the world i read it it's all right mrs brown laughed charlie approved the epitaph as predicted has been quoted and pictures of the plaque published around the world it has been stated that the pacific coast borax company paid for the monument actually it was provided by the park service i had the bronze tablet made in pomona california and charlie brown insisted that he pay for it shorty left a little money he said whatever is lacking i will pay myself on march fourteenth nineteen thirty six the monument was dedicated streamers of dust rolled along every road that led into the big sink trailing cars that were bringing friends from all walks of life to pay tribute to shorty at the grave the rich and the famous stood beside the tottering prospector the husky miner the silent stoic indian brown was master of ceremonies telegrams were read from john hayes hammond and other distinguished friends old-timers whose memory spanned thirty years one after another wedged through the crowd to tell funny stories that shorty had told or some homely incident of his career one was revealing we had the no countess low downess hooch drinkin loafer on the desert at ballarat we called him tarfinger he came over to shorty's cabin one day and said he was hungry shorty loaned him five dollars when i heard about it i went over i said you know he's a no good loafin thief i figured i was doing shorty a favor instead he blew up well he can get as hungry as an honest man can't he they understood what o henry meant when he sang test the man if his heart be in accord with the ultimate plan that he be not to his marring always and utterly man the epitaph shorty harris wanted seemed fitting above me write here lies shorty harris a single blanket jackass prospector as i turned away i thought of the monuments erected to dead caesars who had left trails of blood and ruin shorty harris simply followed a jackass into far horizons and by leaving a smile at every water-hole a pleasant memory on every trail attained a fame which will last as long as the annals of death valley End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of loafing along death valley trails by william carruthers this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen a million dollar poker game herman jones young texan with keen blue eyes and a guileless grin dropped off the train at johnny a railroad siding named for the nearby johnny mine at the ripe age of twenty-one he had been through a shooting war between new mexico cattlemen and needing money to marry the prettiest girl in the territory he had come for gold finding it lonesome on his first night he sought the diversion of a poker game in a saloon and gambling house he bought a stack of chips sat down facing the bar and a moment later another stranger entered inquired if he could join the game told that twenty dollars would get a seat the stranger standing with his back to the bar was reaching for his purse when herman saw the bartender pick up a six-gun with his elbows on the bar and his pistol in two hands he aimed the gun at the back of the stranger's head and pulled the trigger the victim dropped instantly to the floor his brains scattered on the players the poker session adjourned and jones was standing outside a few moments later when he was tapped on the shoulder come on he was told we're giving that feller a floater herman didn't know what a floater was but decided it was best to obey orders and followed the leader into the saloon approaching the bartender the spokesman pulled out his watch bob he said quietly at six o'clock it won't be healthy around here after six thirty he set a canteen on the bar and walked out without a word the bartender pulled off his coat gathered up the cash called the painted lady attached to his fortune and said sell out what you can get i'll let you know where i am picking up his hat he left 
no one ever learned the cause of the murder or the identity of the dead with no luck in the johnny district or at greenwater herman left the latter place on a prospecting trip in partnership with another luckless youngster previously mentioned harry oakes on a hill overlooking the dry bed of the amargosa river about four miles north of shoshone he saw a red outcropping on a hill so steep he decided nothing that walked had ever reached the summit and for that reason he might find treasure overlooked herman being lean and agile climbed up to investigate oakes remained under a bush below jones returned with a piece of ore showing color a popular song of the period was called red wing and because he liked sentimental ballads herman named it for the song camp was made at the bottom of the hill oakes assumed the dishwashing job to offset an extra hour which herman agreed to give to work on the trail somebody told oakes how to bake bread and while herman was wheeling muck to the dump harry experimented with his cookery the bread turned out to be excellent and oakes took the day off to show it to friends that's the sort of fellow harry was herman said you just couldn't take him seriously the red wing didn't pay and when abandoned all they had to show for their labor was a stack of bills on borrowed money oakes left the country herman remained to pay the bills a few miles east of shoshone is chicago valley which began in a startling swindle and ended in fame and fortune for one defrauded victim a convincing crook from the windy city found government land open to entry and called it chicago valley it was a desolate area and the only living thing to be seen was an occasional coyote skulking across or a vulture flying over the promoter needed no capital other than a good front glib tongue and the ability to lie without the flicker of a lash a few weeks later chicago widows with meager endowments scrub women with savings and some who coughed too much from long hours in sweatshops began to receive a beautifully illustrated pamphlets that described a tropical eden with lush fields cooling lakes and more to the point riches almost overnight for a hundred dollars anyone concerned would be located soon people began to swing off the goose as the dinky train serving shoshone was called and head for chicago valley among the victims was a widow named holmes with a family of attractive intelligent children one of these was a vivacious beautiful teenager named helen the holmes were handicapped because of tuberculosis in the family this in fact had induced the widow to invest her savings herman jones used to ride by the holmes place en route to the parham branch on hunting trips and owning several burrows he thought the holmes children would like to have one taking the donkey over he told helen you can use him to work the ranch too better and faster than a hoe he brought a harness and a cultivator showed her how to use the implement it was inevitable that investors in chicago valley would lose their time labor and money thus when helen holmes returned the burrow to herman one day herman was not surprised when she told him she was on her way to los angeles to look for a job but what can you do well, i wish i knew i can get a job washing dishes or waiting on table shortly afterward he heard from her just a little note saying she was a hello girl on a switchboard knew she'd land on her feet herman grinned and having a bottle handy he gurgled a toast to helen he had to tell the news of course and with each telling he produced the bottle so he was in a pleasant mood when somebody suggested a spot of poker to mention poker in shoshone is to have a game and in a little while dad fairbanks dan modine deputy sheriff herman and two or three others were shuffling chips over in the mesquite club herman had the luck and quit with seven hundred dollars fellas he said as he folded his money take a last look at this roll you won't see it again oh you'll be back fairbanks said but herman did not come back instead he went to los angeles found helen at the switchboard she confided excitedly that she had a chance to get into the movies as soon as she could get some nice clothes fine herman said when can i see you he made a date for dinner had a few more drinks and when he met her he had a comfortable binge and a grand idea listen helen you wouldn't get mad at a fool like me if i meant well would you why herman you know i wouldn't she laughed i'm a little liquored and it's kind of personal but you're a gentleman herman drunk or sober 
i've been thinking of this picture business i nicked dad fairbanks in a poker game you know how i am lose it all one way or another you take it and buy what you need and it'll do us both some good the refusal was quick it's sweet of you herman but not that i just couldn't you can borrow it can't you so i won't drink it up the argument won and soon theatre goers all over the world were clutching their palms as they watched the hair-raising escapes from death that pictured the perils of pauline the serial that made helen holmes one of the immortals of the silent films she died at fifty-eight on july eighth nineteen fifty when charlie brown became supervisor in charge of death valley roads he wanted a foreman who knew the country herman jones had hunted game treasure fossils artifacts of ancient indians all over death valley and knew the watercourses the location of subterranean ooze the dry washes which when filled by cloudbursts were a menace brown made him foreman of the road crew at shoshone herman jones gray now was tinkering with a battered ford when a big rolls royce stopped he looked around at the slam of the door stared a moment at the man approaching dropped his tools wiped his hands on a greasy rag well i'll be he laughed harry oaks where have you been all these years oh knocking around grinned oaks wanted to see this country again they sat in the shade of a mesquite talked over greenwater days and the homely memories that leap out of nowhere at such a time oaks noticed herman's ford then he pointed to the twenty thousand dollars worth of long sleek rolls royce herman i'm going back to new york in a plane i want to make you a present of that car Herman Jones, dumbfounded for a moment, looked at his Ford, smiled, and shook his head. Thanks just the same, Harry. That old jalopy's plenty good for me. No amount of persuasion could make him accept it. Knowing that Herman Jones could use any part of twenty thousand dollars, I marveled that he didn't accept the proffered gift. Then I remembered that the Red Wing had produced only sweat and debts, and Jones had paid the debts through the bitter years. In the little town of Swastika, in the province of Ontario, Canada, you will be told that Oakes was booted off the train there because he was dead-beating his way. The country had been prospected, pronounced worthless, and nobody believed there was pay dirt except a Chinaman. Harry Oakes had an ear for anybody's tale of gold and listened to the Chinaman. He was thirty-eight years old. Lady Luck had always slammed the door in his face, but this time, January 1912, she flung it open eleven years later oakes was rich he had always talked on a grand scale even when broke at shoshone with a taste for luxury he began to gratify it he bought a palatial home at niagara falls and served his guests on gold platters as his fortune increased he gave largely to charities and welfare projects such as city parks playgrounds hospitals these gifts lead one to believe that the belated payment of three hundred dollars borrowed from dad fairbanks was a calculated delay so that harry oakes could enjoy the little act he put on at baker during world war i he gave five hundred thousand dollars to a london hospital was knighted by king george v in nineteen thirty nine he became friends of the duke of windsor and at his nassau residence was often the host to the duke and his duchess the amazing wallace warfield baltimore girl who went from a boarding-house to wed a british king sir harry oakes was murdered in the palatial nassau home july seventh nineteen forty three allegedly by a titled son-in-law who was later acquitted a verdict denounced by many in connection with the story of helen holmes told above it should be explained that the original title was hazards of helen and following an old hollywood custom pate produced a new version called perils of pauline in this the heroine's part was taken by pearl white End of chapter eighteen Chapter 19 of Loafing Along Death Valley Trails by William Carruthers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Death Valley Scotty. A strictly factual thumbnail sketch of Walter Scott would contain the following incidents. He ran away from his Kentucky home to join his brother Warner as a cowhand on the ranch of John Sparks, afterward governor of Nevada. He worked as a teamster for Borax Smith at Columbus Marsh. 
He had a similar job at Old Harmony Borax Works. In the 90s, he went to work with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. He married Josephine Milius, a candy clerk on Broadway, New York, and brought her to Nevada. He became guide, friend, companion, and major domo for Albert Johnson, Chicago millionaire who had come to the desert for his health. He did some prospecting in the early part of the century, but never found a mine of value. America was mining mad following the Tonopah and Goldfield strikes, and Scotty went east in search of a grub state. He obtained one from Julian Girard, vice president of the Knickerbocker Trust Company, and a brother of James W. Girard, who had married the daughter of Marcus Daly, Montana Copper King, who was later U.S. ambassador to Germany. Scotty staked a claim near Hidden Spring and named it the Knickerbocker. He gave Girard glowing reports of a mine so rich its location must be kept secret. Scotty appeared in Los Angeles unheard of in a ten-gallon hat and a flaming necktie and with the natural showman's skill tossed money around in lavish tips or into the street for urchins to scramble over. This was the well-staged prelude to the charter of the famed Scotty Special for a record-breaking run from Los Angeles to Chicago. Though Scotty stoutly denies it, he was lifted to fame by a big and talented, sorrel-headed sports editor and reporter on the Los Angeles Examiner named Charles Van Loan and John J. Burns, passenger agent of the Santa Fe Railroad. Scotty meant nothing to either of these men, but the publicity Burns saw for the Santa Fe did, and the red necktie, the big hat, the scattering of coins, and the secret mine made the sort of story Van Loan liked. Here, Scotty's trail is lost in the fantastic stories of writers, press agents, and promoters. Several years afterward, when his yarns began to backfire, Scotty swore in a Los Angeles court that E. Burt Gaylord, a New York man, furnished $10,000 for the Scotty special spectacular dash across the continent, the object being to promote the sale of stock in the secret mine. More remarkable than any yarn Scotty ever told is the fact that although headlines made Scotty, headlines have failed to kill the Scotty legend. You may toss our heroes into the ash can, but we dust them off and put them back. Likeable, ingratiating, Scotty will brush aside any attack with a funny story and let it go at that. In a lawsuit for an accounting against Scotty, Julian Gerard asserted he was to have 22.5% of any treasure Scotty found. Judge Ben Harrison decided in Gerard's favor, but the only claim found in Scotty's name was the utterly worthless Knickerbocker, and Gerard got nothing. The claim showed little sign of ever having been worked. A few broken rocks, a few holes which could be filled with a shovel within a few moments. Passing the claim once, I stopped to talk with a native. This is the scene of the Battle of Wingate Pass, he told me. In case you never heard of it, it was fought for liberty. Scotty's liberty, that is. Gerard got suspicious about Scotty's mine and decided to send his own engineers out to investigate. He ordered Scotty to meet them at Barstow and show them something or else. It worried Scotty a little, not long. He'd learned about Indian fighting with Buffalo Bill and met the fellows as ordered. When he led them to his wagon waiting behind the depot, the Easterners took a look at the wagon, another look at Scotty, and one at each other. The wagon had boilerplate on the sides, rifles stacked army fashion alongside, outriders with six guns holstered on their belts, and Winchesters cradled in their arms. Don't let it worry you, Scotty said. Paiutes on the warpath, old dripping knife, their chief, claims my gold belongs to them. Dry gulched a couple of my best men last week. The Easterners turned white, and Scotty gave them another jolt. Butchered my boys and fed em to their pigs. But we are fixed for em this trip. They sent word they claimed to exterminate us. Maybe try it, but I've got lookouts planted all along. Let's go. He shunted them aboard, shaking in their knees, and headed out of Barstow. The party had reached that hill, you see, when suddenly out of the brush and the gulches and from behind the rocks came a horde of redskins yelling and shooting. Scotty's men leaped from their saddles and the battle was on. 
the easterners jumped out of the wagon and hit the ground running for the nearest dry wash and that was the closest they ever got to scotty's mind you've got to hand it to scotty the story made front page from coast to coast and it was several days before the hoax was revealed unexplained though undenied was the statement that albert johnson was in scotty's party listed as dr jones it is assumed that he had no guilty knowledge of the hoax the most astounding achievement of scotty's career was attained when he interested in an imaginary death valley mine al myers a hard-bitten prospector and mining man who had made the discovery strike at goldfield Raul King of Los Angeles, Bon Vivant, and manager of the popular Hollenbeck Hotel, and Sidney Norman, who, as mining editor of the Los Angeles Times, knew mines and mining men. These were certainly not the gullible type, but with a yarn of gold, Scotty induced them to hazard a trip into Death Valley in midsummer when the temperature was 124 degrees scotty may have missed the acquisition of a good mine when he failed to find one lost by bob black while hunting sheep in navavet's range bob found some rich float honest bob said i knocked off the quartz and had pure gold he tried to locate the ledge but he couldn't match his specimen later he returned with scotty but a cloudburst had mauled the country they found the corners of bob's teepee but not the ledge they made several later attempts to find it but failed bob always declared that some day he would uncover the ledge and might have succeeded if he hadn't met ash meadows jack longstreet one day when both were full of desert liquor bob passed the lie jack drew first taps for bob all kinds of stories have been told to explain albert johnson's connection with scotty the first and the true one is that johnson coming to the desert for his health hired scotty as a guide liked his yarns and his camping craft and kept him around to yank a laugh out of the grim solitude but that version didn't appeal to the old borough men they could believe in the hydrophobic skunks or the black bottle kept in the county hospital to get rid of the old and useless but not in a santa claus like albert johnson it just don't make sense handing that sort of money to a pot-bellied loafer like scotty albert johnson was able to afford any expenditure to make his life in a difficult country less lonely he could have searched the world over and found no better investment for that purpose than scotty genial resourceful and never at a loss for a yarn that would fit his audience scotty was cast in a perfect role as a matter of fact, whatever it cost Johnson for Scotty's flings in Hollywood or alimony for Scotty's wife, it probably came back in the dollar admissions that tourists paid to pass the portals of the castle for a look at Scotty. Of course, they seldom saw Scotty, never in later years. Mrs. Johnson was an intensely religious woman and didn't like liquor, and that disqualified Scotty this is scotty's room the attendant would say and that's his bed oh isn't he here not today scotty's a little under the weather went over to his shack so he wouldn't be disturbed mrs johnson was killed in an auto driven by her husband in town's pass when to avoid going over a precipice he headed the machine into the wall of a cut in 1939, Albert Johnson testified that he first met Scotty in Johnson's Chicago office when a wealthy friend appeared with Scotty, who was looking for a grub stake. Johnson said he gave Scotty something between a thousand and five thousand dollars. When the attorney asked him to be more definite, Johnson replied that at the time his income was between one half million and two million dollars a year, and the exact amount consequently was of no importance then since then johnson testified i have given him a hundred and seventeen thousand dollars in cash and about the same in grub stakes mules food and equipment they went together into the mountains as johnson explained because i was all hepped up with his claims further explaining his connection with scotty he said i was crippled in a railroad accident my back was broken i was paralyzed from the hips down through the years I got to have great fondness for him. Albert Johnson, whose fortune came from the National Insurance Company, died in 1948, leaving a will that contained no mention of Scotty. But one laurel none can deny Walter Scott. 
he did more to put death valley on the must list of the american tourists than all the histories and all the millions spent for books pamphlets and radio broadcasts the almost incredible case of jack and myra benson proves that p t barnum was not wholly wrong in his dictum regarding the birth rate of suckers newly married in montana they loaded their car and set out to seek fortune in the west we didn't know anything about gold jack confided if anyone had told us to throw a forked stick up a hillside and dig where it fell we would have done it near parker arizona they were having supper in camp when another traveler stopped and asked permission to erect his tent nearby myra invited him to share their supper and during the meal the stranger told them he was a chemist and that he had prospected over most of the west he had found a clay that cured meningitis he said and this had led to fortune in one town he had found the entire population including doctors and nurses down and out the clay had cured them within a week among the cured was the son of a rich woman who had given him five thousand dollars grateful for the fate that had brought this man into their lives the bensons confided that they had hoped to reach the california gold fields but car trouble had depleted their cash and asked if he knew of any place where they could pan gold go to silver lake in the san bernardino county california he advised them and your troubles will be over on the edges of the lake is a thick mud get some tanks and boil it you'll have a residue of gold jack and myra set out over the colorado desert then climbed the providence mountains to worry through the deep low sand of the devil's playground after three grueling weeks they reached the lake there they boiled the mud then an old prospector became curious about their unusual performance the world slipped out from under the bensons when he told them they were the victims of a liar with five dollars they headed for death valley found themselves broke and gasless at cave spring jack knocked upon the door of a shack he saw there the woman who opened the door was jack's former school teacher mrs ira sweatman who was keeping house for her cousin adrian Eckberg, there for his health those who travel the death valley road by way of yermo and cave spring will remember that every five miles tacked to stake or bush were signs that read water and oil this was adrian egbert's fine and practical way of aiding the fellow in trouble myra and jack later acquired a claim near road spring a short distance from salisbury pass road into death valley and moved there to develop it i had been away from shoshone with no contacts and returning was surprised to find myra there i inquired about jack why haven't you heard she asked and from the expression in her eyes i knew that jack was dead as best i could i expressed my condolence knowing how deeply she had loved she said he went up to the tunnel to set off three blasts i heard only two he was to come after the third blast i knew something was wrong and went up by god mr carruthers jack's head was blown off to hell and gone myra's language failed to mask the grief her welling eyes disclosed only once in her long helpful life did myra ever stoop to deception the old age pension law was passed and myra was entitled to and needed its benefits but myra wouldn't sign the application she made one excuse after another but finally stella brown got at the bottom of her refusal myra had been married to jack for forty years and just didn't want him to find out that she was a year older than he mrs brown at last persuaded her to put aside her vanity hell jack grinned when told about it i knew her age when i married her on cold winter nights myra could always be found in the snake house where a chair beside the stove was reserved for her one night i said jestingly you never play poker what are you doing here she whispered wood's hard to get i'm saving mine then came one of those mornings when one's soul tingles with the feel of a perfect desert day and myra was up early she came to the store what got you up at this hour bernice asked i felt too damn good to stay indoors there were a few old-timers in the store and these surrounded her because she was the kind who could tell you that it was hotter than hell in a thrilling way she bought a few groceries and started back to her cabin 
friendly eyes followed her passage along a path across the playground of the little school children sliding down the chute or riding teeter-totters waved affectionately myra was seen to falter in her step then sag to the sand the children ran to her aid and in a moment shoshone was gathering around her myra benson was dead sam flake nearing eighty on the fringe of the crowd paid his simple tribute in a voice a bit shaky but in language hard as the rock in the hills damn her old hide us boys are going to miss myra he turned aside his hand pulling at the bandana in his hip pocket and shoshone understood though she was buried five hundred miles away every man woman and child in shoshone wanted a token of love to attend her and about the grave that received her casket was a wilderness of flowers End of chapter nineteen